All right, guys, as usual, I've got to get to work in a minute, but I've got a lot of thoughts about the CES stuff from AMD and Intel mostly, maybe a little thoughts on Nvidia, but like, okay, I, I there were some highlights I was impressed with, but some things were just like, okay, AMD was apparently showing that Halo Infinite beta, well, not beta, but their uh, gameplay footage of the Halo Infinite thing was using an RTX 3080. AMD, what are you doing? Uh, do, do you have that little confidence in your own stuff? I mean, like, are your drivers not ready for your own AMD platform, but Nvidia is? Like, I don't... That, I, I don't know, guys. That just seems really silly. And, and to back up why this is so silly, I don't understand why they even show that gameplay. I watched the whole AMD press conference live, and when they were like, okay, and we've got our Ryzen uh, 7000 platform here running Halo Infinite, and then there was no frame rate counter. Like, all that could tell me is that, yes, it is capable of playing the game for a few seconds without crashing, because there was, all Lisa Sue said is the frame rates are high. What does that even mean? And then the fact that they were running the demo on an RTX 3080, just like, can we just not have that in the thing at all? Just talk about the Ryzen 7000 series. And if you're, if the only gameplay you can give us doesn't include a frame rate counter and you're using your competitor's video card to run it, that's just a bad look, AMD. I did not like that. Now, that being said, we had some more exciting stuff about, you know, we've got our, our Zen 3D coming soon, and I'm happy to see that coming, but I think a lot of us were hoping for it to be more across their product stack, but it looks like it's just coming on the 5800 uh, series, so they'll have the 5800 uh, turned into a, a Zen 3D with their, you know, uh, 3D V-cache thing. The point is it's gonna help your gaming performance and that is gonna be a fantastic gaming processor. And I watched some follow-up interviews. I, I think it was this one over here uh, where Frank Azor was uh, being interviewed and was uh, asked like, okay, why just the 5800? And he basically said that, okay, since, since the limit to what games can usually take advantage of is the eight cores, right? So there's not a lot of point adding this on to the 5900X or 5950X. And he also says, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, design things to be taken into account when adding that uh, 3D vCache onto the chips. So it made sense to just limit it to basically make the ultimate gaming CPU, which is what this will be really good for. And there's no reason that they have to spread that out among other platforms. Now, the fact that this isn't coming until like the spring tells me that what's really going on here, and, and Intel did a similar thing. I don't think I have the article pulled up, but these are really just like, the two companies trying to argue over who has the fastest gaming processor, right? So AMD had the fa world's fastest gaming processors with Zen 3 until Alder Lake came out from Intel. And now AMD is saying, okay, but we're coming out in the spring with this 3D vCache version of the 5800. So now we have the world's fastest gaming processor, except it's not out yet. But then Intel has also said, but we have our 12900K S that's super bend for for incredible like I think you can go up to 5.5 gigahertz boost on a single core and over five or at five gigahertz all core performance. And again, why is that coming out? Who really needs that? Who needs that is their marketing teams. I think these are really more just about marketing. Although I've got to say that the 5800 with the uh, 3D vCache, what's really nice about that is that's going to be for the people who have been on this AM4 platform, and I've got some more, more to say about this, the people who have been on the AM4 platform for a while now, this is going to be your top end upgrade chip that you can finally get to, right? And it's going to provide amazing gaming performance. So if you were on maybe like a, a lower end Ryzen 3000 series chip, and you want to stay on that same motherboard, plop in this, uh, you know, 5800 3D vCache thing when that comes out, and now you don't need to buy a whole new motherboard or anything like that to upgrade, and you have a fantastic gaming CPU that's going to be relevant for years to come, and that's fantastic. And um, that's another thing I've been seeing in these follow-up interviews with the AMD employees, 
uh, talking about how one of the strengths of the AM4 platform was how many generations it was supported for. Now, what they didn't talk about was how a lot of that actually had to be pushback from their own community. Because like with the Ryzen 5000 coming out, they didn't want to support the older motherboards and there was really a lot of community backlash to get support there. Although we did eventually get it, so that's good. And then even getting some of the 300 series uh, motherboards to support the 5000 series chips was really more down to the uh, motherboard manufacturers, not AMD, getting BIOS updates to allow that. So. Um, they're talking up the uh, backwards compatibility of it and the longevity of that platform, which is true, but it's maybe not as like, uh, <laughs> you know, sunshine and rainbows as they're trying to point it at this point. But what I'm hopeful for is that they've learned from that, that that was a huge selling point and they are doubling down in their marketing for AM5 to be compatible and they're not giving specific amounts of time, but they're talking about how the AM4 platform lasted at least, they keep saying like four or five or six or seven years. I think when they stretch it out to six or seven years, they were talking about from its design conception rather than when it actually released. Um, but I think they're they're trying to imply that, a, that expecting a similar time frame from AM5 could be uh, reasonable. And, and I think that's, um, it's good to hear that that's their goal, although they're very careful not to commit to it. Everyone has been really careful not to say, we will support this for at least X generations. Okay, so definitely uh, careful how much you're, <laughs> you're uh, reading into that. But uh, we have seen some neat things like apparently the AM4 coolers should be compatible with AM5 CPUs, which is really nice to hear because all of these things are like the, the longevity of the platform, having designing them in such a way so the AM4 coolers are still compatible on AM5 CPUs. All of these things are helpful to budget conscious uh, PC builders who want to hold on to that same motherboard for a while, hold on to that same cooler for a while. And this is a, a smart move from AMD to really buy into this because this can help you, you know, if you sell somebody on the first generation of AM5, right? Um, or maybe you already sold them on AM4 and now they liked how they could upgrade a couple generations of CPUs on that board. Now people are gonna be more confident to buy AM5 because if you're deciding between buying like an Intel, uh, Intel chip, which right now at the current moment is a better, platform, I think, than, than what AMD has out right now, because it's newer, right? But some people might be convinced to wait for AM5, because if you buy into AM5, you'll probably be more confident that you can get some meaningful upgrades to your CPU in the future without having to change platform. Whereas from the Intel side of things, you might be better off right now, but you're likely to have to upgrade your motherboard along with your CPU in the future. And that's not only more expensive, but also a huge hassle. Not everybody likes tearing apart their whole PC build and taking out the motherboard and all that, uh, you know, too regularly. So anyway, this is a lot of interesting stuff that we're seeing here. Um, I like to see that they're committing to that, but let's get into some of the uh, other things I didn't really like. Now, one thing's just speaking of Intel really quick. Um, so I was so disappointed that we didn't get more from, from the ARC branding of stuff, uh, you know, the, the actual discrete GPUs from Intel. We saw very little information about it, basically just suggesting that they are shipping to OEM, OEM partners. And they were saying it is coming in quarter one, 2022. But as some people have pointed out, and I, I pulled up this video cards article about it, um, Intel's website had a whole bunch of graphics that kept saying coming in quarter one, 2022 but those are being removed from their website. That's disappearing from their website. So I don't know if they're backing out of that. So I wouldn't be surprised if we do see something in quarter one, 2022, but at this point, given the fact that we haven't seen anything really about their discrete desktop GPUs from Intel themselves, I'm gonna say that if we see anything in quarter one, it's probably laptops. I think we're gonna be seeing mobile stuff from laptops. If anything's on the desktop, maybe it's gonna be coming from OEMs as part of a pre-built system. Uh, I'm gonna be pretty pessimistic here and say that we don't get the actual just like consumer discrete GPU being sold separately. Uh, I don't think we'll see that until at least quarter two and I'm gonna guess late quarter two just because it's taking so long for us to uh, hear anything about this. 
And as far as when that might happen, we do have an Intel uh, uh, event announced for May 10th. So I have a feeling that at that May 10th event, where we'll actually hear more specific details on their discrete GPUs. Again, that's me speculating, but I, I think that's how long we're gonna have to wait. And that's really sad to see, because then we're pushing in close to when we're expecting to see new generations of chips coming from NVIDIA and AMD. Now, speaking of new stuff coming from NVIDIA and AMD, let's, uh, let's talk about the 6500 XT. Guys, the only thing that this could have going for it is the fact that, and by the way, this was, this was confirmed in an interview with Frank Azor. Why does it only have four gigabytes? Well, for one thing to, to, to cut down on cost, but as I actually predicted in one of my videos talking about the leaked info when we found out it was four gigabytes, this also does make it not attractive to miners. And since mining performance has a huge impact on the price of a GPU, um, I think that they could be correct that this will help control the costs. But the card itself is going to be very, very weak. It's very underwhelming. And the fact that it has like ray tracing support is useless at this price point. So, I mean, the fact that they're comparing this up against a 1650 and RX, uh, RX 570, like, fine, it's an upgrade over those. And if they can actually keep the price point down, I'm not saying that this is a completely useless card, um, but it's really disappointing, especially since it's been pointed out um, that a lot of people have already been criticizing the 6600 series cards for having only a PCI 4.0 times eight interface, which is half of the full 16 lanes. Apparently the 6500 XT is only a times four interface, which on a PCIe 4.0 system, so if you're building a new build, should actually be fine, I think, at a card with this performance level. Um, if you're putting this in on an older system, so if you're upgrading an older system, um, that I think could be an issue. I really want to keep an eye on this in reviews uh, and see reviews on this on a PCIe uh, 3.0 system because that, that could choke up the performance, especially since this only has four gigabytes. If it's having to draw from system memory over a choked times four interface, I'm not a huge expert on how all of that works, but I think that could be a problem. So um, this might be the kind of card that makes sense in a very low end new build that's on a 4.0 platform, but might not make a lot of sense as an upgrade on a 3.0 system, but we'll need to see reviews uh, to tell us uh, more details on that. And man, I do have to leave to work in a second. So I had a bunch more I was gonna say, but let's talk about Nvidia for a second. Launching that 3090 Ti, is just really frustrating because those are the chips that should be going to 3080s. People have been waiting a year. Like literally people are on waiting lists for a year now and still haven't got their 3080. And Nvidia is just producing 3080 Ti's, 3090s, and now 3090 Ti's just to suck up money from consumers um, who are just willing to pay whatever to get their thing. And the people who wanted that 3080 because it was actually a good value performance thing when it launched and been on a waiting list for a year, um, screw them, let's just make more money off a 3090 Ti, which I have a feeling is gonna cost over $3,000 in the actual market, which is disgusting. Now the 3050 looked reasonable if the MSRP of 250 actually makes any sense whatsoever. It certainly looks a lot more compelling than a 6500 XT that only has um, four gigabytes of VRAM, but here's the issue. I have a feeling that the 3050 is gonna cost at least $500 on the actual market, and that the 6500 XT will probably be closer to $300 on the actual market. And that is going to make the 6500 XT probably still a more compelling option for people trying to build a new budget build. Um, with that in mind, I believe we also saw um, some 6500 XTs being listed on European markets um, in France for 299 euros, which is you know a lot more already than the 199 uh, uh, dollars MSRP that we saw. But anyway, so we're starting to get a hint at what the pricing might actually be at launch, and usually they just go up after launch. Man, I need to get to work. You guys are awesome. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Have an excellent day.